buckle up. This one's going to be a doozy. Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution lays out the powers of Congress in as specific as a way as possible. And this was really the intent of the framers to list out the powers specifically that the Congress had throughout the Constitution to eliminate as much doubt as possible. It didn't really play out exactly like they wanted it to, but this is a pretty extensive list. So let's begin. Complete text. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. To borrow money on the credit of the United States, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribe, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States, to coin money, regulate the value thereof, and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States, to establish post offices and post roads, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations, to declare war, grant letters of marquee and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the, uni of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square, as may, by session of particular states and the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of government of the United States, and to exercise like authority over all places purchased by consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings, and to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States, or in any department of or officer thereof. Clause 1. Taxes. Yay. Everyone's favorite thing. Before the Constitution, taxes were, well, not so much of a thing, at least not federal taxes. They could ask states to put money towards the national treasury or request that taxes go up, but they had no ability to compel federal funds under the Articles of Confederation. This was so bad and debt started to accrue that even the first draft of the Constitution gave the Congress an ability to tax without qualification or limitation, because they needed it. That was too broad to get through, so they just put some qualifications on it that seem pretty minor. The uniformity that this clause talks about has been deemed to only be speaking about geographic discrimination. There is a lot to this first paragraph as you can imagine, but it's all about granting the Congress the power to tax, to keep the government operational so that it can take care of its debts, provide defense, which is the military, and keep up the general welfare of the people. This isn't new, it's actually predates the Constitution itself, the idea at least, and then gets, you know, formulated here. So if anyone's still thinking that the Constitution doesn't spell out the ability to tax folks, it's right here, and it was there even before the first draft of the Constitution was made. From here, though, it took all the way until 1937 to basically solidify that the same clause allows Congress to spend the money that it taxes. The litmus test is, does it fall under the subject of other powers listed for Congress? And if so, then they're good to spend it. And that general welfare line, it's pretty broad. And that makes it so that there 
aren't really a lot of stipulations on how the money will be spent or for what purpose it serves. So as long as it's kind of one of the powers or close to, a-okay. Still needs to get voted on internally, but that's about it. Clause 2. An easy one. Congress can borrow money on the United States' behalf. What's in your wallet? The U.S. Treasury. Clause 3. This is known as the Commerce Clause and prevents Indiana basically from negotiating with Switzerland or even Texas or others for trade. It basically is designed to stop states from acting like they are a standalone nation in the world of commerce. And commerce here is interpreted pretty broadly here by a cornucopia of Supreme Court rulings that extend this power beyond a simple interpretation of just buying and selling. But that's a bigger can of worms that I won't get into here. Out of all of these rulings, what we get is commerce being considered more broadly as just traffic. And the Sherman Act that's passed in 1890 to regulate commerce and hinder the creation of monopoly. I could easily make just a video on this clause and may come back to it to do so. Clause 4. This is also known as the Naturalization Clause. It grants Congress determination over how someone becomes a citizen of the United States when they start as a foreign national. This is exclusively within their purview. You might think that a person just has to be born to a U.S. citizen while abroad, and that automatically grants them citizenry by the Constitution. But that isn't true. Not really. The Congress actually probably stole something from old English tradition, nationality by descent, which granted citizenship to anyone born by a U.S. citizen. Well, I guess in their case, a U an English citizen, just not on English soil. So in this case, the same got applied to U.S. citizens, just not on U.S. soil. What this means is that essentially any U.S. citizen who is granted the right just because they were born to other U.S. citizens while abroad, not on U.S. land, the Congress could essentially revoke that at any time. Natural born citizens, however, that's beyond their control. They also are granted powers to revoke citizenship in other situations, but only given voluntary criminal or other types of assumed relinquishment. It can't just be willy-nilly. Congress got on this naturalization stuff early and in the Naturalization Act of 1790 made its first uniform rule. All free white persons who resided within the limits and under the jurisdiction of the United States for at least two years would be granted citizenship if he or she showed good character and swore allegiance to the Constitution. This was a way for them to bring over all the other white people that they wanted to grant citizenship to in just one sweeping you know, rule, but it still had a lot of holes in it where they could discriminate and not just simply by race. And we haven't even gotten to bankruptcy. This one's pretty direct though. We went from every state having different laws, interaction, interactions with debtors and whatnot, to a national bankruptcy law that overrides state bankruptcy law. And yeah, that's also changed over time in scope, what it does, how it interacts with debtors, and such. Boom. On to Clause 5. Although this clause is what it says it is, the ability for Congress to print, issue, and reclaim money, it also grants them power to do things like compel someone to surrender gold in exchange for an equivalent amount of money. They can also prevent, restrict, and or tax corporations who issue their own currency on that currency. Clause 6. This is sort of an extension of the previous clause, granting Congress only the specifically additional power of punishing the creation of counterfeit currency. So the correction here, or the specifics here, is they can't actually punish the use of. That's still strictly within the purview of state. Clause 7. Reading this clause, it's necessary to know that it only gives them the power to establish post offices and roads. From there, they can get other companies and groups to build, states to maintain, and work with the states to also manage them. On top of that, it does grant them all the powers necessary to ensure transit of the mail is safe and speedy. Importantly, at the start of this, it was within the power of Congress to also determine what would be carried and what would not without review of any other constitutional rights allowing them to prevent certain mailers from going out, for instance, because they didn't want them to go out. 
giving absolute power to Congress, and it even overrided a series of Supreme Court rulings. But then later rulings determined that the power would be limited by other constitutional rights. All of this came to a head in 1965 when the Supreme Court heard a case where what was declared to be communist propaganda was prevented from being forwarded through the mail. And the Supreme Court ruled on the side of the First Amendment, indicating that so long as the post office was there, they had to follow all constitutional guarantees. Interesting fact, if a mail truck driver, for instance, was going over highways, but they didn't have a valid driver's license, they couldn't be punished for that or pulled over and stopped because that could impede the transportation of mail. That's a perfect job for someone who doesn't have a license. Clause 8. This is the Intellectual Property Clause. Welcome to Congress's ability to issue patents and copyright. The good news about this clause is it nationalized the intellectual property systems that each state had, which were clunky and expensive to interact with, and each had their own variation requirements, and it was just a mess. With one solidified system, it made it a lot easier for people to seek protections. On top of that, this talks to how the framers wanted to incentivize by instituting an ability for creators to have a protected time frame to recoup their time, effort, and costs that it takes to create them. This wasn't new, of course, to the US. England also had a variation of both the patent and copyright laws. And since 1790 here in the United States, over many changes, copyrights have even gone through changes from being things like 14 year terms that needed to be renewed every 14 years to being a lifetime protection plus 70 years. And that didn't happen all at once, it happened over time. It's important to note that the Supreme Court has acknowledged that copyright can restrict expression of others by limiting them from essentially expressing the same material through reproduction and distribution. This is essentially one of many restrictions on the First Amendment, giving weight to the idea that it's not an absolute freedom of expression. To counterbalance this though, the idea of the fair use doctrine was also created. For patents, the requirements are different. The invention must be novel, non-obvious, meet utility requirements, and be a patent-eligible subject matter. This has been summed up in the Supreme Court's observation that anything under the sun that is made by man is patentable. Discoveries, however, are not patentable, preventing monopolies on scientific discoveries that would then inevitably impede innovation. If you find a rock that cures cancer, you can't patent that. But if you engineer a crystal that exhibits the same properties, that would be patentable. And that was that. The Congress and courts have never had to deal with any discrepancies, oddities, or seemingly contradictory decisions. Zero. Just kidding. Lots of interpretations, cases, and such have led us to where we are today. And it's still not often clear. All right, you might be thinking, what about trademarks? Well, this was deemed not to be a power granted by the intellectual property clause because Trademarks don't need to be original, creative, novel, or inventive. But in the 1900s, the courts interpreted trademarks to be an exercise of Congress's Commerce Clause powers that we learned about a few clauses ago. Clause 9. This clause grants Congress the ability to constitute, which is create, tribunals, which are courts, inferior, which are lower, to the Supreme Court. So this is how we get lower federal courts than the US Supreme Court. Clause 10. The power to try crimes that happen at sea. This one's both vague in the sense that Congress can try someone for treason in the law of nations, which is a quick hand for law so basic that every nation is thought to have them. Think transgressions against what we deem as basic or fundamental human rights. This was not meaning that the laws of the United States would travel outside of it, nor its jurisdiction. This was more to create repercussions towards actions by or against US citizens at sea. Otherwise, someone could go out to sea, commit some felonies, murder some people, steal some US property, destroy some ships, then come back to their home in the US and live without fear of prosecution. Clause 11. Congress has the power to declare war to recoup losses via taxes, to compel for the production, to aid in war efforts, confiscate domestic and foreign property, and a lot more. What they don't get to do is command the military. Clause 12. Congress got the power to declare war from the previous clause, 
and this clause allows them to do what's necessary to create an army and support them. There is some limitations here, but there's not a lot that stops them from appropriating funds for the military. As long as it's gear, vehicles, weapons, etc., there's absolutely no limits on this clause. And then this is where also even the draft comes into play. It's definitely considered constitutional during war times because of this clause and would likely be ruled as constitutional during peacetime according to conversations about this from the Supreme Court at various times through history. Essentially, the limitation of this clause is eaten away at so much by the Constitution's language of, quote unquote, a common defense, that there's not a lot Congress can't do as we often see play out in the federal budget. Clause 13. This is the Constitution being explicit about Congress's powers. So the previous clause is armies, so they had to create another clause to cover navies. And this grants the Navy federal powers that would have been left to the states to deal with without this clause. Clause 14. This clause gives a wide range of ability for the Congress to run military society very differently from civilian society. They can ban books and materials that won't foster loyalty, they can discriminate against sex in the military at all uh, for a long time in total and even still um, based upon roles or jobs a person can perform. They can prevent lawsuits against the military from any enlisted members, they can set age requirements, and a whole lot more. The Supreme Court has indicated that the congressional judgment on how the military should be ran and the kind of governance they're in isn't absolutely free from constitutional guarantees but it's heavily deferential to congressional decision. From there, military courts and laws that bind service folks kind of grew out of this power, and it wasn't until 1960 that the Court of Military Appeals decided that all constitutional rights would be guaranteed to military personnel, except for those that expressly or by implication do not apply to the military, still vaguely keeping that loophole. Before that, though, the Congress could remove protections and rights granted by any amendment if they determined to do so. And just take a note here, it wasn't the Supreme Court that ruled this in some kind of checks and balance, it was the military court that was created and supported by the Congress. So essentially it's still the Congress limiting themselves. It's also true that many guarantees we take for granted as civilians just simply don't apply to enlisted men or women during their service time. But how broadly rights can be dismissed has gotten narrower and narrower as time has gone on, thankfully. Clause 15. The power of Congress compels you. That's right. If you are in a militia, Congress can call on you to fight a war, stop insurrections, and repel invasions. If you disobey, they can hold you accountable and determine your punishment. Clause 16. Congress's power over militia is basically unlimited because of this clause. There are certainly a few exceptions that it seems they've tried to work themselves around. For instance, state militias or state national guards aren't technically federal military, but state militias can be called from a prior clause. And, big and here, if you enlist in a state militia today and for a long time, uh, you are also enlisted in the federal national guard, at which point there's simply no limits on what they could call you forth to do. And then the other limitation is simply the president being able to determine the physical, moral, and professional fitness tests of who can remain enlisted. That's basically it, so pretty unlimited power. Law 17, and here's how we got Washington, D.C. Philadelphia, as you might recall, was the original capital of the nation. One day, June 21st, 1783, a bunch of civilians harassed, shouted at, physically threatened, and verbally abused members of Congress, and no one came to their aid. The state authorities just simply let it keep happening. It wasn't their problem. The members of Congress had to flee the Capitol. Later, they came to the conclusion that they needed a space that wasn't under state jurisdiction so that they could have essentially their own power to protect themselves while at the Capitol. And everything would be under their control, so no situation like this could happen again. So, Maryland and Virginia gave up some land and Washington, D.C. was birthed. The problem is a back and forth that isn't new on how much the people of Washington, D.C. have a say about who runs local government. It started with appointments, strictly from Congress, moved to elections by local commissions and committees, then back to a commission 
that was appointed by Congress, and now they're in some kind of weird hybrid that I don't fully understand. But it's important to note that the people in Washington, D.C., although they can vote for a vice president and president, they don't get to vote on much of their local government, nor does their representative in Congress have any voting power there either. This goes back to that idea that Congress wanted a place free from state authority, and they feared that these voting practices and capacity to basically be a democracy would be something that would hinder that congressional power over this location. Since then, there's been many attempts to get Washington, D.C. into full statehood, and thus far, all of them have failed, obviously. It's also questionable whether or not even if people followed like normal methodologies to get a state in, you know, or voted it in at an amendment, whatever the case may be, that that would immediately make Washington DC a state. It, it's probably based upon the constitution and this clause still gonna require Congress to cede that power over Washington DC to the result of the vote. Clause 18, also known as the last clause of section eight. My words, not theirs. This one extends into a lot of legal situations, but basically it's a catch-all for stuff that got missed in previous clauses. So even though the Congress's powers are listed throughout this section, this clause also gives them any not explicitly listed power as long as it's deemed necessary and proper for their other powers to be effective, essentially. So rarely this clause has ever been looked on on its own, but in many situations it gives a breadth to a previous clause. So in order to do X, Congress needs powers over doing Y and essentially expanding the scope of the explicit power to get it accomplished. Over time, this is expanded with interpretation, not actually narrowed, so they've just gotten more and more power. For instance, the power to do investigations, have committees, different laws for immigrants that could be considered unconstitutional for citizens, and more came out of this clause. All they really had to indicate was that they needed, or it was proper to have those powers in order to implement some kind of previous clause. This is another clause that I might come back to and do an entire video for, as it talks a lot about con Congress's power for immigration, revocations of citizenship, and much more, but not today. Anyhow, that's it. Wow, that was a lot, a lot, a lot. So just signing off till next time. This video is brought to you by Caffeine Zombies. Coffee's so good, it'll wake the dead.